So now we're going to look at actually applying our antiderivatives and being able to do something with this, okay? We, begin, we began our exploration of integrals by looking at areas under the curve. And then we got into antiderivatives, and we haven't really been finding areas. And that's because up to this point, really, we've just been learning rules for finding the antiderivatives. Now we're actually going to get to use these things, okay? And we're going to use them with the definite integral, okay? Now, before we get to what this fundamental theorem of calculus actually is, let's look at the actual definite integral, okay? This notation that you see here, the definite integral of f, you'll notice here we have an a and a b next to our integral, okay? Well, the a and the b are the bounds of an interval that are going to uh, define where we want the area of, okay? So if you look at the rest of this uh, statement here, it says if capital F of X is the antiderivative of F of X, where F of X is continuous on the interval where X is between A and B inclusive, all right? Now let's stop there for a second. This A is what we call the lower bound, or boundary, we'll just say bound for short, lower bound, and B is the upper bound. Now the nice thing about this is that when we do this, we're no longer going to be just getting an expression, we're actually going to find a number. All right, your answer should be a number because we're actually getting the area within a defined range of values here, okay? So, how do we find this area? Well, this says here, and this is a basic version of the fundamental theorem of calculus. This says that the definite integral from A to B of f of x dx is capital F of B minus capital F of A. Right. Now, there are a couple of questions that might come to mind here that I want to address. First of all, is I thought when we did antiderivatives, we had to have a plus C. Okay? So the first question that we could ask here is, where is or are the plus c's? Okay. Well, let's examine that, okay? If I take the integral of f of x dx, dx, that's capital F of x plus c. Now, according to our fundamental theorem of calculus here, if I take the integral from A to B of f of x dx, it's that antiderivative, so that's f of x, d, f of x plus c, but I need to evaluate it at B, and I need to evaluate it at A and subtract them. Now here's some notation that you'll see. We often put this in brackets. Sometimes you'll see people just write a right-hand bracket here, or you'll even just see them write a vertical line. Other times you'll see people actually put it in brackets on both sides. That's what we'll probably do more often. And then they'll go from A to B. They put that A there and the B there to show that we're using the fundamental theorem of calculus we're going to evaluate. Okay? So let's actually do it at this point. It says to do F of B minus F of A. So I'm going to put B in first and I have capital F of B plus C uh, minus capital F of A plus C, plus C 
And you'll notice here, when I distribute the negative, I have capital F of B plus C minus capital F of A minus C, and the C's cancel each other out. So I get just F of B minus F of A. So that's the answer to the first question. When you are doing definite integrals, you actually don't even have to bother with the plus C because it's just going to cancel out anyways. Okay? So that's the first thing. Now the second question is, why does this work? Um, why are we subtracting? Why does this work? Or why does subtracting work? And it comes down to understanding really what's going on with capital F when you evaluate it at a particular number for x, okay? So let me illustrate here. I'm going to draw a function. Here's a function f of x. And uh, let's make it in green. There we go. Okay, so here's my f of x. And let's say that this value right here is where b is. And let's, see, let's say this value right here is where a is. Okay? Now, the area that I want is this area right here between them. That is what the integral of f of x dx from a to b is going to give us. Okay? It's that green area. Okay? The integral here is going to give us the area between the function and the x-axis, all right, within this range. So let's first of all think about capital F of B and what that is actually giving us. Capital F of B gives us the area between F and the x-axis to the left of b. Okay? So if I were to look at that on the graph here, it starts here at b, and it's this whole area to the left. Now, obviously, that's more than just what we want, right? Mm -hmm. So, how do I get rid of the part that I don't want? I subtract the area to the left of A. Well, what's the area to the left of A? Capital F of A. Okay, capital F of A is the area between F and the x-axis to the left of A. Okay, so it gets rid of all this stuff over here that I don't want. Okay? And what's left over is just the area that I'm looking for, okay? So that's why this definite integral is capital F of B minus capital F of A, okay? So that's how that works. Now, there's a big old proof for this. We're not going to look at... Um, if you take college calculus, you guys will prove this at some point. But, um, but that's a very basic version of why this thing works, okay? All right, so now that we've answered those questions, let's talk about this idea of area a little bit more specifically and make sure that we understand some important distinctions here.
Okay? We've mentioned here that, we've, that the integral is giving us the area under the curve. Okay? So area under the curve, in this case over here, you can see, is the integral from A to B of f of x dx. Okay? Now, Nick had asked earlier, you know, why don't we go below the x-axis? Well, if the function goes below the x-axis, we actually still will look at uh, that area. However, that area we consider to be negative. Okay? So, as you can see over here, this area between where the function crosses the x-axis and b is actually a negative area, okay? So when you do the integral from a to b, it's going to take that positive area, the positive area up here, and then it's going to subtract this much that's down here below the x-axis, okay? So that may seem like kind of a strange thing. We have negative area. Oh, it's kind of like when you had negative velocity. The negative indicated direction. Here, the negative in our area indicates whether it's above the x-axis or below the x-axis. And depending on the application, that'll tell us something too, okay? Um... So, this is the area between the curve and the x-axis, whether that happens to be below the curve or above the curve. If it's below the x-axis, then the area is going to be above the curve and below the x-axis. All right, so we have that negative, okay? Now, um, when you're just asked for the integral, that's what you're finding. And another way we could think of this is that you are finding the net area, okay? The positive minus the negative, all right? We'll do examples later on where you're given a velocity function, okay? And you guys remember we dealt with position functions, and when you take the derivative of position, you have velocity. Well, if we have a velocity function, we take the integral of it, That'll tell us our position, okay? And if we do a definite integral from A to B, that'll tell us our displacement, okay? That's going to be the net area. We might have gone to the left, we might have gone to the right, but how far away from our starting point did we end up? That's our displacement, okay? Now, on the other hand, sometimes we don't care about where we ended up. We care about how far we actually traveled, a total distance. That's what this second part would have given us, okay? The total area between a curve and the x-axis, if, if you are asked for that, this means that we're going to treat all area as positive whether it is above or below, okay? So obviously we can't just do the integral from A to B here, okay? What we're actually doing in this case is we are going to take the integral from A to B of not just f of x, but the absolute value of f of x. In other words, any part that's below, we would actually take and reflect above the x-axis to make it a positive area. Now, don't worry, this isn't that hard to do. The key, though, is you have to recognize where do we start to be below the, the x-axis. So I'm going to identify a value C here, okay? And if I need to do the integral from A to B of the absolute value of F, then what I'm going to do is take the integral from A to C, and I can just treat that normally because it's above the x-axis, okay? However, somehow I need to also take the integral from C to B 
And I know that that's going to turn out negative. So what do I do with it? Absolute. I could do absolute value. Or minus. Put a negative in front of it. There's actually quite a few ways that you could handle this. Whatever you do, you got to make sure this ends up positive. Yes, you could just subtract it, so you're subtracting a negative. That's one way you'll see it. You'll also see it as plus the absolute value of the integral from c to b of f of x dx. So you'll take the integral first, then take the absolute value of that portion. Is that supposed to be b and c? Which yeah, you're going from c to b, oh. here to here. Now, the other thing, what did we say if I went from b to c, if I went backwards, what does that do? It does the same thing. It makes it negative as well. So another way that you could handle this is to actually set up that second integral. Integral from a to c of f of x dx plus the integral from, and I'm going to go backwards, from b to c. That'll force that thing to be positive as well. So any of those three options are possible. I don't care which one you do. And don't overcomplicate it. Just find the integral. You're going to get a negative number, make it positive. Okay? So, that is, uh, that's an important distinction to make because those are two very different questions. Okay? Two very different questions. You've got to pay attention to the language when you're dealing with these problems. Okay? So, let's illustrate this without even having to do actual calculus. Let's look at a graph of a function here where we have things that we can find area for without calculus. Okay, so let's first of all do this semicircle. Okay, here we have the semicircle. Uh, what would the area be for the semicircle? Uh, 2 pi r, 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 pi r, pi r squared over 2. Pi r squared over 2. Yeah, pi r squared, and r here is 2. So pi times 2 squared over 2. So this is 2 pi. Okay? It's okay. So now we have this down here. Forget about the fact that it's underneath the x-axis for right now. What's the area of this? 4. Okay, it's just 4. It's a 2 by 2 square. And then you have this semicircle over here. It would just say it's 1 pi chi over 2. Well, it's, it's 1 pi times a half because it's only a half of a circle. So pi times 1 squared over 2. This is going to be a half of a pi. Okay? Normal serving size, half of a pi, right? All right, so we figured out areas. Now let's relate these to integrals, okay? So if I asked you to give me the integral from 0 to 4 of f of x dx, what would you say that is? 2 pi. That's 2 pi, okay? So that's 2 pi. Real quickly here, um, the integral from 4 to 6 would be, it's below the x-axis, so it's negative 4. And then the integral from 6 to 8 is that half a pi. Well, if I'm trying to find this, I'm just doing, I'm doing 2 pi minus 4 plus a half pi. Okay. But if I did this, that's different. Okay. That would be 2 pi plus 4 plus a half a pi. Okay. Those are two different things, and that's what we were illustrating in the, on our previous slide here. So here you're going to get 
two and a half pi minus four. Here you're going to get two and a half pi plus four. Plus four. Okay. Depends if you want area or total area. Okay. okay. Here are a number of properties of definite integrals since we've been talking about these. Most of these we've used quite a bit. Um, so the ideas are very simple. Um, some of them are just intuitive rather than um, necessarily something we've used a lot. For example, here, the integral from A to A, it's just the area of a line segment. And you know from geometry that a segment has no area, so the integral is zero. Here's what we mentioned earlier when we were talking about dealing with that negative area. But the integral from B to A is going to be the opposite of the integral from A to B. Okay, so just uh, you're moving from right to left instead of from left to right. And that makes the area negative. Um, here we've done this quite a... Uh, we, we saw this with those areas as well. The integral from A to B plus the integral from B to C. If these are the same, then that will equal the integral from A to C. And um, typically we use this actually in reverse more often. We'll find a point between A and C for whatever reason uh, we need to, and we'll break this up into two separate integrals like that. The integral of a summer difference that hasn't changed from when we were doing antiderivatives. Then the integral of a constant. If you think about the constant function, it's the horizontal line, okay? So if I'm finding the area between a horizontal line and x axis, which is another horizontal line, between a and b, I just have a rectangle, okay? And the height of that rectangle is going to be c. The base of that rectangle is going to be whatever the distance between b and a is, so b minus a. So you can see here it's just c times b minus a. And then the integral of a constant multiple. This, again, is just a property we've used a ton throughout use doing antiderivatives. If we have a constant inside, we can pull that outside of the integral. This is a nice way of, you know, if you've got like a radical 2 in there, you can pull it out, do the whole definite integral with your fundamental theorem, and then multiply your answer by a radical 2 or like a pi or something like that um, that can just get messy as you're doing the rest of it. Just pull it out, do the definite integral of the simpler function, and then multiply your final answer by that constant. Okay? So then we have how to find integrals on a calculator. Okay? And for this, there are two methods that we can use. If you have an n-spire Okay, it actually works the same as the TI-84. It's just a matter of where you find the um, where you find the button to do the integral. Um, you have a button that has a number pops up a bunch of little templates that you can use, and one of those is the integral. So it's really easy to find. Um, the TI-84. Uh, has a template that you can use that's actually a lot easier than using the TI-83. But I'm going to show you two ways because, um, especially if you've already graphed it, it's really easy to get the definite integral. And if you have the TI-83, you're going to want to use the graph every time. Because otherwise, you see here the notation on the screen, fn int x e to the x comma x comma 2 comma 5, you got to remember what order to put things in in the calculator. Okay, and that's um, just one more thing to mess up. So if you use the graph, it's a lot easier. Okay, so we're going to actually do this uh, integral from 2 to 5 of x times e to the x dx. All right, so I'm going to add a video here. Okay, so we can see here uh, on the calculator, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to graph this function, all right? So I have x times e 
to the x power. Okay, I'm gonna, let's do a zoom standard here. I don't know what my window's set at. Okay, so you can see here, there's our graph. And I wanted, I want it to go from two to five. Okay, well, two to five, uh, I can see where it equals two, but five is gonna get pretty big, right? Uh, it'd be nice to see the whole thing. You don't have to do this part, but if I plugged in five, I'm gonna have five times e to the fifth. That's how high my window needs to go. So guess what? If I just go to window and I scroll down to my y max, you can actually type in expression. So I'm gonna do five times e to the fifth, and that'll make sure my window goes high enough to where I can see the whole thing. That's kind of a neat thing that you're able to do. Okay, so now you can see that's way down there, and then it shoots up as we know uh, exponential is going to, especially when it's multiplied by an x on top of it. Okay, so how do we do the integral from two to five? Well, you may have noticed when you found zeros and x-intercepts and that kind of thing, if you hit second calculate, at the bottom is the integral of f of x, okay? So I'm gonna hit seven. And notice it asks me for a lower limit, okay? The lower limit is two. So I just type in a two. And then the upper limit is five. So I type in a five. And look at that, it even colors it in for you because it's it knows it's dealing with area under a curve. And you can see there that the integral of f of x dx is 586.2636 if we round it. So it tells you the integral on the bottom. It says the integral on the bottom, okay? And it even tells you the interval that you use here. We use the interval from two to five. Can you read that? Okay, so that's one way of doing it, and that, that works whether you have a TI-83 or an 84, okay? Now, if I quit out of this, on the 84, well, actually, on either one, if you hit math and you scroll down, you'll see this FN int. On the 84, it's number 9, okay? Now, this is where the 83 and the 84 are different. The 83 just says FN in parentheses. You got to remember what order to type stuff in, like you saw on the screen uh, behind the video here. Um, the 84 gives you this nice little template, so all you have to do is type everything in. All right, I hit a 2, use my left and right arrows to get to the different parts. There is 5, and it's X times e to the x and I have to tell it what variable to integrate with respect to so I have to make it dx and if I hit enter there's my answer 586.2636 if I round the four decimals well this is four significant figures so I could just make it 586.3 okay no, you don't have to do both ways. I'm showing you both ways because on the 83, the first way is definitely better. And especially if it's something you've already graphed, which we're going to see later on uh, why looking at the graph can be helpful. If it's something you've already got graphed, you don't have to go back out to the home screen and calculate it there. You can just use calculate integral and type in your two bounds and it'll give it to you. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, that's, uh, that's how we can use our calculators to find integrals.